What's up, Chiefs Kingdom? Welcome to another episode of Sometimes Weekly Sports and Stuff. I'm BJ Kissel, and this is our special guest, Aaron Borgman. Spent a number of years with the Philadelphia Eagles and then the Kansas City Chiefs as an athletic trainer. Aaron and I have known each other a long time, and luckily we get to sit here, have a tasty beverage, thanks to our friends here up at the distillery in 360 Vodka. But if you have a chance, if you're in the Kansas City area, take the trip. It's about 30 minutes, 35 minutes up here to Weston, Missouri and take 435 up, get off on the highway. You come up here. This place is a little gem that uh, I don't think enough people know about, and they take care of us. It's always fun to come up here. Got a little 360 lime and a little limeade right now, which is exactly what I need on this Friday. Exactly. I, like I was telling you earlier that I knew this place was here, but the sheer compound nature of everything like really really impressed me it's a really cool place yeah if you can't tell it's obviously christmas themed with all the bars in kansas city with the with the pop-up bars they're open on the weekends uh you can go to their their website get all their schedules but cool place to come they'll take care of you matt uh patrick jules everybody up here will take care of you but um a lot of fun and i'm excited for this podcast because we were, we knew we were going to do this together and it was just like let's see how the game goes against the chargers and we'll figure out what we want to talk about and it actually just fell right into pocket and this is going to be a travis kelsey appreciation podcast as two guys you were around him a lot know him really well i crossed paths with him fortunate enough to get to know him a little bit over the years and uh i'm excited and he had a pretty good game last night yeah um and i think anybody that knows trav is not surprised by any of that i tell you what they don't come to be any better competitor than what he is. He's yeah. he's such a gamer. All the stuff that he's got to get ready um, to for their body. And I think it's all NFL players in general, but Kelsey in particular, just because of the physical nature of the way he plays the game and his position and all of that, that I don't think anyone's ever on the outside ever going to get a, a accurate depiction of exactly what these guys go through to get ready to play each week. You know, I, I've said this for a number of years since I've been out of the league, and there's a pseudo debate about the best tight end in the league and mm -hmm. to me there's obviously I'm a little bit biased but there's no debate um, what he goes through the fact that he plays every game he doesn't miss snaps he comes and he comes every day to practice he, the, the stuff that he plays through that people don't even know about is unbelievable and he's just one of the toughest hard-nosed players I've ever been around. So I was yeah. lucky to work with him for a couple of years. And we're really lucky that it worked out for him to come in Kansas City and get with Andy Reid. And I still think, and we're going to share stories of our time with Travis that, that we can share. Um, but one of my, fa one of my favorite um, you know, stories about Travis when he first arrived in Kansas City, and I know, you know, I don't know how much you claim St. Louis compared to Kansas City. I'm a Kansas City kid, so I'm not a huge and of St. Louis, but I always love uh, Kelsey's uh, draft night story mm -hmm. of getting the call, you know, seeing Missouri with the 816, right. and his first reaction was like, damn it, I don't want to go to St. Louis. I don't want to go to the Rams. And it just, he immediately endeared himself to a Kansas City kid that was asking him the question, and I'm sure to a lot of Kansas Cityans that, were for whatever reason, uh, have that kind of competition with St. Louis. Well, um, I can say this pretty confidently. I'm one of, like, two people in the world that have had the pleasure of taking care of both Kelsey brothers. There you go. And so, um, you know, they're very unique in their own right, but we were very happy to draft him in 2013. And, you know, he had that first year, which uh, kind of got right medically. Yep. But then since then, obviously, he's taken off and just done some amazing things and played through some incredible things and just showed his toughness both on the field and off the field. Um, you know, and yes, I understand I'm a little bit of a St. Louis guy, but mm -hmm. I love both cities a lot. They both are awesome. Uh, no favorites here. And so, yeah, like just, just an awesome experience. Yeah, 10 catches, 191 yards, and two touchdowns. And the, what Andy Reid says, basically the equivalent of a walk-off home run uh, for the touchdown in overtime last night that anybody who's watching got a chance to see Kent Swanson and I at the, at the Kingdom Bar and Grill last night. We did a second-screen watch party, so we were live. Like, you could see our reactions as the plays were happening. And just he's so good across the middle and that reverse step where he reverses direction and the touchdown Kelsey, he's always been so good at that, but I want to get into the stories because everybody sees the highlights. We're each going to share a few. I want what's when somebody asks you about Travis Kelsey and, and the greatest of all time, I've said that for a couple of years, obviously biased, uh, but he's the greatest tight end to ever play the game. And there's, you can make a case in a lot of different ways. I know James Palmer had the tweet, and we made a big deal a few years ago about he was the first tight end in NFL history to have four straight 1,000-yard receiving seasons and how big a deal that was that Rob Gronkowski, Antonio Gates, Tony Gonzalez, none of those guys ever put up numbers like that. And now he's done it six straight years. So no tight end ever done it four times. Now he's done it six times at that just natural benchmark of 1,000 yards that everyone seems to use to, to kind of set those things apart. But when somebody asks you about Travis Kelsey besides – 
being the greatest of all time, what's the first thing that comes in your mind? What's the first story that you think of? Boy, I can't tell you the first story I think of or the second story, or maybe in the <laughs> fifth or tenth story. But, um, you know, I, I think it's a culmination of things. I think it's seeing how he played on Sundays, mm-hmm. um, you know, seeing how he would come into the training room on Mondays, seeing how that evolved over the course of the week, what he went through, what he'd do to get his body right, uh, put his faith in our medical staff time after time after time again, mostly uh, he was really close as one of the other athletic trainers and just, just his commitment to all that. Now, my personal favorite story with Travis is there's a game, and you'll pardon me, I can't remember the year, everybody can look it up on YouTube, but he's mic'd up. Mm-hmm. And they have him, you know, the typical mic'd up things on the field, talking to players, this and that. Well, Travis is a known prankster, trickster, right? He doesn't tell people that he's mic'd up. And he comes over to me on the sideline, and he starts talking to me. And there's an official NFL league rule that we're not allowed to use our phones on yeah. the sideline unless it's for medical business. And he comes up to me, and I'm oblivious. I'm in the game, like, paying attention to people on the field. And he asked to use my phone to call his mom. <laughs> and I am just, you know... What, what are you talking about? Like, what are you doing? Like, and everybody can look this up. It's hysterical. My wife thinks it's the funniest thing on the face of the earth. And he, we go through this whole process of he wants to order pasta. And like, I, I don't understand it. Like, and I'm, I'm out there on another planet because I've got duties, actual duties to do. <laughs> right. Game, You're, right? You're working. And so he says something about, you know, some, the little pasta. And he says, you know, the, the gnocchi, right? And I, I do remember this. I now. start playing yeah. back into it, thinking like he's funny, and like, I, I obviously know how to pronounce the word gnocchi. And I was like, okay, yeah, the ganache, you know, just like playing back into him. And everybody took off with that for like a month, saying that Aaron doesn't know what gnocchi is. And so <laughs> I can show that to my wife right now, and she still cries laughing and watching it. So I'm immortalized on YouTube thanks to Travis. That's funny. I know one of the 65 guys. I think years ago, I don't remember exactly which one it was. So I don't want to put him out there like that, but. When the guys were mic'd up, they used to have Kale go over and like ask him weird questions or give him like <laughs> Kale's one of the equipment guys go up and just get say the most weirdest like it's almost like uh, like motivational speeches or motivational lines. And sometimes they just kind of like go like this, and sometimes they'd have probably the reaction that you did to Travis, like the hell are you talking about? Well, and that's the thing. Like most of the time we know who's mic'd up or they'll say, hey, you know, I'm mic'd up. So watch yeah. what you say around me. Well, Travis decided that he's going to use this as a source of personal entertainment, which of course he did. Yeah. And it all turned out great at my expense, which is fine. Like I have no problem with that. <laughs> that's the good stuff. That's the best content is when you get their personalities out and you get to see Travis having some fun. Um, you know, one of the things, and it's not the jokey side of Travis, but one of the, and I've told this story, <clears throat> excuse me, a few different times. But it was Radio Row in Houston. And what ended up being like three days that we were down there ended up being like three days that I probably talked about more during my time with the Chiefs than any other like stretch of time. And the Chiefs didn't play in the Super Bowl. It was just one of those, everyone in the NFL world from a media perspective is at Radio Row the week leading up to the Super Bowl. So from a content creation standpoint, you go down there, you get interviews with all these people and you create content for Chiefs fans. So it was hard because we had never been there for that. So we went down, we were trying to see what interviews that we could get. And the chiefs had just lost. It was the Patriots. I believe we'd lost to them in the playoffs. So fans are pissed. Like they don't want con. Yeah. Tough game. And we're down there like talking about the season and no matter how you could could interview Roger good. Like you could get, I don't want to hear from him, but like you could interview anyone radio row four days after the chiefs lose a heartbreaking playoff game. And it could be the greatest interview of all time, but no one's going to like, no one cares. They're mad. They don't want to get a bunch of chiefs content, but while we were down there, I had a conversation with Travis Kelsey that obviously I will never forget. And we interviewed Patrick Mahomes, this kid out of Texas Tech, because, you know, his Steinberg's like Matt and Lee and then we were running around on Radio Row trying to give him all these interviews. And they came up like, hey, do you want to interview Patrick Mahomes? It's like, yeah. Like, sure. Okay, Stater, sit him down. I want, we want to draft quarterback. Let's, let's sit him down and talk to him. And the first question, get to Travis in a second. First question I asked Mahomes, like, what do you know about the Chiefs? He's like, well, Chris Ballard and I have had dinner together a lot and yada, yada, like it know all these guys start naming off all these scouts and I'm like Chris Ballard's not an area scout <laughs> like Chris Ballard's having dinner with you four times like we are watching you um in a big way and I was like we can't use that Patrick <laughs> like, I don't know you don't know <clears throat> internal team media but they would uh have a problem if I put that out there uh four months before the draft but uh, what I'll always remember about Kelsey um outside of the fact that he was there to do Old Spice stuff. And he's got a relationship and I'm sure he still does with Old Spice, does a lot of stuff, but he goes around Radio Row, he's got an Old Spice shirt on and does like 15 minute interviews, just as like this car wash. And 
he's got to do like two minutes of talking about Old Spice every time he goes. Like, that's how it works. And they pay him and they go do all that stuff. Well, Aaron, his manager, like they were so booked up with his interviews on Radio Row. Like there wasn't time for us. They didn't know we were going to be there. It's off season. So it's not like it goes through PR. Like the kind of players are out on their own a little bit. And so I saw Travis. I was like, hey, can can we sit down and talk to you? Like we're here. We're just kind of like running around trying to find people. And he looked at his manager and he's like, I think we're booked up, but man, let me see if I can take care of you. And I'm thinking like, this happens all the time. I was like, never going to see him again. Like that's not going to happen. He came back like two hours later, once he was done, was supposed to leave, came back to do the interview with us just to sit down and do an interview again, four days after they lose a tough playoff game. And I remember thinking like, that's cool. Like getting the interview is cool. And this isn't the first time I have another story about this. Uh, There's a theme here, but for him to sit down and do that interview was awesome just because he came back and he made time for it. But the other part of it was the content that came out and it was probably as open and honest as a conversation as I'd ever have, I've ever had with Travis. Maybe it's because the season had just ended and kind of the guards down, he just kind of opened up about stuff. But I asked him about leadership and this and that. And he told me that the first time he ever felt like he had a voice in the locker room to step up and talk as a leader was that year because his teammates voted him as a captain for the playoffs. Right. That meant everything to him in that moment, maybe different, but in that moment, I've never been so sure that a player, like seeing a player talk about something that in a very real way meant everything to him. And then he, and then combining a couple of different conversations that I've had, but talking with Alan Wright in his office, the longtime chief's equipment manager, telling me conversations that he's been a part of with Tony Gonzalez and Travis Kelsey. And the advice that Tony gave to Travis was you're going to have a platform that your teammates will listen to you probably three or four years before you think you have it. He goes, I was too late in my career when I realized that if I spoke up when things were bad, like people would stop and listen to me. He's like, you already have that. You need to know that now. And that combined with him, his teammates voting for a captain kind of, I don't want to say matured or grew him up a little bit, but that was what he said was the defining moment for the leadership and all the intangible stuff that now we praise him for. I want to say like it was shown before, but really hit home after that, like during that playoff stretch. And it just, I will always remember that side of Travis. Yeah. And I can say from my point of things that, you know, what he did on the field, what he did in the athletic training room, what he did day to day to get himself ready for the games, how he, you know, would conduct himself on the field um, as far as getting back up, going back in the toughness that he showed both mentally and physically is a testament to his personality and that doesn't happen overnight, right? Like you build that over the course of years. And I think he would give a lot of credit to some of the veteran players that mm-hmm. were there when he was first drafted for helping him with that. And, you know, we saw changes too, like every other rookie as goes to a veteran. Yeah. But, you know, everybody wants to say things like, oh, you know, he may not be a vocal leader. You may not, he might prove it with his play. Well, the great thing about Travis is he does both, mm-hmm. right? You know, he he can go out there and do what he did last night, but he can also fire people up in the locker room, the stuff that you don't see. He can get in people's uh, backsides and, you know, really say, hey, you got to do this, this, and this. And so that's what makes him such a special player and a special person, quite frankly. It's hard. Like, you've been there and you work with the players directly more than I do. You help them in a very real way. I'm like a digital cheerleader (laughs) in a lot of ways, just like – uh, let's talk about him, tell their stories, all of that stuff. And getting to talk to him is very real. But in that aspect, like you're helping get on the field to do what they do to, to put food on the table for their families. But uh, with Travis, like it, it was always, he's exactly what you want in that position. Doesn't take himself too seriously. Uh, it's fun. But to your point, it's really hard in a room for, full of alphas <laughs> to be the alpha and be respected in a lot of ways. It helps when you're the greatest of all time at your position in a lot of ways. But um, man, I just, his temperament, the way that he comes across, I don't think we're, I don't think we're going to properly appreciate everything he's brought until he's long gone. For sure. And his career and and put all the playing stuff aside, you know, obviously he does a lot of great work with his foundation stuff and the stuff he does for kids. I had a chance to um, actually sit down with him in March for just a little bit at a, uh, mutual friends wedding mm-hmm. and we didn't talk about football one time it was like hey man how you doing this and that and he, he's a caring guy like mm-hmm. he's just a good good person yeah we had a chance a couple weeks ago with casey sports network we did a holiday raffle and toy drive that we raffled off last night uh, but we went and did a tour of operation breakthrough mm-hmm. down there and jennifer heineman over there who's worked with aaron and travis and, and all of them to help get it set up 
if for anyone who doesn't know, you know, he bought the muffler shop across the street and turned it into basically a STEM center uh, called the Ignition Lab. That's for kind of the older kids as they don't kind of age out of a lot of the stuff at Operation Breakthrough for younger kids. And they wanted stuff for those teenagers, those high school kids to kind of just give them the, the technology and the resources to, to play and just kind of like open up their mind to different you know, think robotics, like all of these things, like you get a chance to go and, and we got the tour from Jennifer, like I said, last week, and she was waxing poetic on what Travis did and what it's meant to those kids and the, the impact that he's made. And it's not just, you know, going out and catching a touchdown in overtime, uh, which is very real. And that like the joy that it brought to Kansas city and all of us jumping up and down was very real. But when it comes to impact, man, like that's the stuff to me that, that is cool because it's genuine. It's not, Hey, I'm going to, a little bit of money and send out a tweet and be done with it and feel like I helped. Yeah. Uh, it's a very genuine, authentic, um, coming from a really good place. And not that, I'm not gonna say I know his family a lot. You know, his, his brother, I've talked to his, uh, his mom a few times, but, uh, seems it comes from a great family. And like I said, I don't think he's going to get enough, um, credit, not just for what he does on the field, but off the field in Kansas city as well as we continue to tell stories. So I want another one from you favorite on the field moment from Travis Kelsey. How do you choose? Um, you know, the, the, the amount of ridiculous catches and runs and, you know, I, I, I can't choose just one, but I will tell you the ones that always got me were the, the tough catches in traffic. Mm-hmm. And then he'd bowl over a linebacker or he'd ridiculously be one-on-one with a safety, which you know how that usually turns out, and just make people look silly, kind of like what he did last night. And, you know, you just kind of have to laugh because not everybody gets to see that in person Mm -hmm. and here we are on the field seeing it like in real time it's just it's insane some of the things that he can do athletically a lot of people don't know what a great athlete that he is in general and what all the sports that he played (laughs) in high school and you know he was originally a quarterback in Cincinnati Mm -hmm. so you know uh, just the things uh, I've seen him throw a football ridiculous Mm -hmm. I've seen him hurdle people on the field I think it's the the body of work that does it for me not one defining moment um and I I tell you I've been around some pretty good tight ends or seen some pretty good tight ends some hall of fame tight ends that went up against us over the years and I, I don't know anybody better yeah, and the fact that he and Patrick are on the page so much with a lot of those option routes and those things that, you know, just because a play goes the wrong way, it's like he ran the wrong route. I'm like, they just missed the read. Like, and and the I'll say this, things. too, to, to Travis's credit, with multiple quarterbacks, he's done it, too. Yeah. You know, it's not just Patrick. You know, you know, as amazing as Patrick is, you know, Trav was doing this stuff with Alex for a yeah. long time as well. Not exactly that 1,000-yard mark every year, but some really, really amazing things there, too. So that's a testament, again, to him that it's not being parlayed off on one person. It's, it's Travis. That's, that's the linchpin of the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the last story that I want to share, and I, I've told this one before, and it's similar to the other one, uh, but the Super Bowl. Post game of the Super Bowl, uh, anyone who's been there, the confetti's falling on the field about 15 minutes after the game, and uh, the star players and the, the Kelseys, the Mahomes, and those guys are getting pulled off to all the corners of the field where all the different television networks were set up doing their post game stuff, and one corner's Fox, one corner's CBS, ESPN, all of it. And he was in between going from one to the other. And me, like, I'm in between not knowing what to do, like, trying to find Dan, because I was down there for the radio network. And I was talking to Dan Israel. I was like, what do you need from me? Like, post-game interviews? He's like, enjoy it. Like, if you get it, great. Uh, He's like, just enjoy this moment. And I'll never forget that from Dan, too, because I did. Like, I'd never taken photos with anybody or anything like that. I was very careful. I look back through my phone after the Super Bowl. I'm taking selfies with, like, 60 people. I have pictures with Rick, everybody in the locker room. Ted Cruz and I have a picture from the locker room. I was talking to everybody back there. But what I remember... Go ahead, please. No, what I remember about Travis is he was being escorted by, you know, one of the producers or somebody from one place. And it was, like, an NFL PR guy because I know what they look like. They're in a suit. They're very buttoned up. And it's, like, the young producer working for ESPN that she's bringing him over to their station or whatever. And he was on his way to it. And I was waiting to do an interview. I had my mic. I was all ready to go. And we just made eye contact and he just kind of went like that and then like moved the girl. And I have it on camera uh, because there was another guy that was filming and I found him afterwards. And I was like, I want that video. Like, I don't know you, but text, here's my phone number, text it to me. Cause that was cool. But he we made eye contact. He just kind of went like this, came over, put his arm around me, talked to him for like, like 60 seconds. I mean, that's a radio interview, not very long. And then he went and did his thing. And I'm telling you, Aaron, like, and I, we've talked, you and I have talked about this even, you know, when we were still both working for the team, but you worked with the players in a very real way. We're digital, we're on the business side. It's a little different for us. I'd never felt more a part of things 
than when he did that right then. It mm-hmm. wasn't being on the field. It wasn't any of those things. It was, he didn't have to do that. He looked at me. Those are the things that meant everything to me. Cause sure. it was like it, on the business side, and that's a different discussion. It's not a bad one. It's just, it's, you can t- either business or your football right. and you know what side you're on. There are very distinct lines there. And to be on the business and feel a part of the football stuff in certain ways, it doesn't happen a lot, but that moment for me was like, okay, I feel like I'm a part of this and Travis, the one who did it. So biased, whatever, I'll always love him for that. Cause sure. it meant everything to me in that moment. I'll piggyback that story with one more since you asked for it. Uh, we were at the pro bowl in mm-hmm. Orlando. It was the first year that the pro bowl was in Orlando. We had gone, our staff had gone to back to back pro bowls once in Hawaii, once in Orlando, which was kind of a unique dichotomy to begin with, <laughs> but, uh, two very different places. Um, we had, I think that year we had five chiefs on the pro bowl team and had- after the game, I'm not a big memorabilia guy. Like it's just not something I have a ton around my house, but I grabbed a sign out of the locker room and I had gone around to each chief to sign that sign that said Pro Bowl 2016 or whatever it was, Orlando. And when I got Travis to sign, he's like, man, this is going to be pretty special for you someday. And I was like, yeah, it will be because it meant something to me because I had worked with those players. Yep. And then that was like the end of their season kind of thing. And so that's a memory that sticks out. Yeah. I I never asked for a ton of autograph. I was never a big autograph guy, even a picture guy. Because I just, you don't cross those lines. No. And then maybe because it was business side, like it was just, maybe it was just weird for me because you're so told, like, don't do this. Like, my job is to talk to them. Like, I don't know what part to do this for. And how do you f- fall in line with that? And again, this is a completely different discussion, but it's a, it's a tough dynamic. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, like I said, I'm not a real big thing like that. I've gotten autographs for other people and memorabilia and things like that. But those unique instances, I think it was fun to mark. Like, like you said, with your interview, you've got video of that. So that's yeah. awesome. And so that's special to you. And so that was special to me. And so, yep. you know, again, a credit to him. Yeah. I, I want, I'm curious how many people have stories like that from Travis just being out in the community sure. just because he is so genuine and so good. And, you know, he's out having fun, you know, with Patrick and doing all those things. Like, it's just, it's special for him. Um, it's special for Kansas City to have him in our community and do these things. And obviously on the field is a completely different deal. Um, before we wrap up this show, I appreciate everybody for listening to this. How much, and I had this conversation um, yesterday, actually. I think his game, if he wants to continue playing, very similar to like the Antonio Gates, where like, I feel like even today I'm faster than Antonio Gates was his last year in the league, but he knows what he's doing. Like he's just a veteran laboring around, but he'd still get 40, 50 yards out on the field. Travis Kelsey's game is going to age very well from an athletic standpoint, from a, how he understands the game, how he knows where to go in certain situations. Do you see him continuing to play for a long time from what you know? And I know not insider information, but just... No, but, uh, you know, listen, um, I always kind of thought that my time evaluating football player skill on the field was a little bit limited based upon what I knew about football player skill. I will say... Which is amazing that, coming from somebody who's been around football as long as you to have that. Um, I, I would say that the it's game great. has evolved to, you know, really highlight some of these new players' skill sets, right? And so with that in mind, you see Travis has kind of formed all of these new players coming out of college, right? And so these players are now making their games to look like what he started off at nine years ago, eight years ago. Um. And so I think... You know, we see that now in these younger rookies coming through and how they're utilizing tight ends in college and things like that now. And again, a very rudimentary understanding of football skills. But I think that says where the game's going, A, and B, how long these players are going to last should they choose to want to now. And people that, you know, really, really enjoy playing the game, I think are going to have a chance to play it a little bit longer now if they want to. Yeah, and especially with, with Andy Reid knowing that he's going to take care of Travis's body. And I think, you know, I asked you earlier, like, your favorite on-field moment. And I remember, like, dumb thing. Like, I don't remember, like, these big, like, moments. I remember it was the Super Bowl year because I was on the sidelines. The only reason I would have heard any of this. But, you know, Travis, I think he gets called, like, three vertical routes in a row. Like, just reads running him down the field, like, 40 yards. And he takes himself out, like, taps helmet, runs out because he's tired. And I was standing, like, three feet from Coach Reed, and he just screams, Kels, what are you doing? We just set this all up for you. And he just yells back, like, you fucking ran me all the way down there four plays in a row. I was like, I'm tired. And they're just, like, yelling back and forth. And if the TV catches up that, catches that interaction without audio, you're going to think, oh, there's a problem brewing. Like, they're yelling at each other. But, like, you're there. It's just that's how people talk. Like, I don't have to tell you that, but, like, 
I mean, it's how so, people talk. So uh, the football sideline is such a unique <laughs> dynamic in a good, bad, terrible, awesome way. Um, everybody's enemies and friends and <laughs> compadres and worst people in the world. And so, like, look, like in the heat of the moment, stuff happens. That doesn't mean that you don't like the person. That doesn't mean that you don't care for the person. That doesn't mean that you don't want to be with that person. Um, competitors compete, yep. right? And so fire comes out in a lot of different ways. And for every one of those stories, there's at least dozens and dozens more of other stuff that people don't see and don't hear. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that happens <laughs> in a big way. I, I had been yelled at several times by people that we're both very familiar with <laughs> running out on the sideline and nothing I'm doing. I just wrong place, the wrong time, making same. Eye, eye, con very, eye contact, very much same. eye contact with the wrong person, wrong assumption of what I'm asking, whatever it is. Uh, but it's all love. People are down there. I, you, in one ear, out the other. If you've been in the competitive environment, that's what happens. Like that's that scenario. You don't take it personally, but, uh, man, this was fun. Like for I enjoy me. catching up with you, uh, especially when we're talking about a guy that we both have so much respect for. And Travis Kelsey, and uh, I know we just waxed poetic on him for like the last 30 minutes. Doesn't feel like it's enough for everything that he's done, but we all see the highlights. But just to let people know when they're listening that, you know, the genuineness that you and the authenticity when he's talking about the Ignition Lab, things that he's doing in the Kansas City community, things that um, he's just doing in general, like it, it's coming from an authentic place. Yeah, and I guess what I'd say to everybody is what what you guys see out there in the public, that's real. Like this yeah. isn't a guy putting on a face. Um, and for what everybody sees, it's even better in person. Yeah. So. And it's sad because it does happen. Like mm -hmm. there is the other side of it. And sure. that's why we're saying like, this is not that no. at all. And for a player of his caliber, again, greatest of all time to be the greatest of all time in the community as well. And in a lot of very real ways is very, very cool. So anyway, thank you all so much for listening to this podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all of that good stuff here at KC Sports Network. And we will continue to bring new and fun ways to connect you guys with stories, perspective, and analysis on your Kansas City Chiefs. Thank you for your support. Have a great holiday week. Continue to um, get ready for the Chiefs day after Christmas, 1226. They got the Steelers. So hopefully the Steelers pull off a win this week. Uh, and either the Titans or the Patriots drop, and the Chiefs can get that one seed and get back to home, um, home field advantage in the playoffs. But anyway, thank you all for tuning in. We will see you guys next time.